Hello, and welcome to the New York City Category Theory Seminar. Today we have the honor of having Robert Perret, and he's going to talk about the horizontal vertical synergy of double categories. Uh, Robert, we have this um, tradition here. You have to give us four pieces of information before you start talking. Ready? Yes. One, where you were born. Two, where you did your undergraduate degree. Three, where you did your graduate degree, which I happen to know. And four, where you are now, which I happen to know. But you can... you can. Oh, I, I thought you were going to ask for my password. <laughs> <laughs> no, your credit card number, please. <laughs> right. So I, I was born in Quebec City. Uh, and uh, what, what what were the other questions? Oh, where did you do your undergraduate? At Laval University. Right. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I didn't finish high school. Oh. And so I wanted to go to St. FX where all of my friends were going. But uh, they were sort of a stickler for details. So they didn't accept me. And Laval University accepted me, and uh, that's. Uh, 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 and and your, your PhD you did at McGill? My PhD I did at McGill with Lambic, yes. Right. And you're in Halifax ever since? I'm in Halifax ever since, yes, indeed. And, and your first language was English or French? English. So in, in Quebec City, there's uh, there was. Uh, a, a, a sort of an Irish community there, Irish immigrants that came in the potato famine, and my mother was a descendant from there. So her uh, her grandparents actually came from Ireland. My father was uh, uh, French, uh, but we always spoke English at home. But I spoke French outside in the street. Okay. Okay, that's enough. All right, let's hear some category theory. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Nosan, for inviting me and giving me a chance to spread the the word here. I'll just jump right in. Uh, okay, there. So, uh, uh, a weak double category. No, no, no. You didn't. Uh, we didn't see you change the page. Oh, great. Good. So, uh, can you see? It hasn't changed. Okay. Take it away. Go. Fire. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, two categories and the bi categories are well established uh, two dimensional type category theories that have been around for a half a century. Uh, but you, you might think that two categories are special kinds of bi categories, which they are or that bi categories are sort of a bit laxified two categories, which they also are. But in fact, they're, they're very different in nature. They have a different focus. And so what I'm saying here is that two categories are, are categories enriched in cats. So they're categories and they have some extra structure, whereas bi categories are uh, monoidal categories with several objects uh, so that they're their morphisms are sort of object-like. I mean, so this is just a, a general feeling, but if you look at the examples, uh, this is how things uh, turn out, okay? And so double categories is a way of combining the two of them together and then exploit how, how they interrelate. So th this, is, uh, this is what double categories are about. So I'm going to start with a definition of double category then I'll try and explain, I mean, because this is not very transparent. So this is a, what's called a weak double category. So it's, it's a weak category object in the two category cat. So it looks like a category object that has here a category of objects, a category of arrows, and it has domain and codomain functors. It has an identity functor. You take the pullback of D0 and D1 and you can give a composition like this. And, but instead of having it, this composition that you give uh, associative, it's only associative up to some coherent isomorphism. Uh, it's also only uni unitary up to coherent isomorphism. So uh, th th these satisfy the usual coherence conditions, the pentagon condition and a triangle for the identities, okay? So th this is, what a weak double category is. A strong double category is when these are identities. And this, this was defined by Erisman in, uh, in the early 60s, 61, I think, or 62. 
Uh, and he also defined actually two categories just in passing. Uh, okay, so let, let's just look at this a little bit deeper because this, although this is a precise definition, it's not very uh, uh, informative. Uh, Arisman did the weak and the strong, or he just did it? No, he just did the, the strong. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, uh, I think it's Marco and I who introduced the weak. I mean, it's an obvious generalization, but it's, I think it's an important one. Yeah. Anyways, so let's, let's just look a little bit here at this weak double category. So A0 is a category, so it has objects and arrows. So the objects of A0 I'm going to call uh, objects of the double category, and its morphisms are, we're going to call them horizontal morphisms. You'll see uh, why I'm talking about horizontal arrows rather than just arrows. And I'm going to write them horizontally as much as possible and just denote them with an ordinary arrow as we do in category theory. Well, this is a category, in fact. Now, A1 is the category of arrows of our double category. So its objects are arrows too. And those are arrows, I'm going to call them vertical arrows. And I denote them vertically when possible. And I de decorate the arrow with a little dot here. So, so there are two different kinds of arrows. And then they're related by double cells. So uh, these double cells are the morphisms of A1. So the Fs compose and give you a category. Well, that's just the A0, actually. And the alphas will compose horizontally, uh, that's the A1, but the Vs also compose vertically, or the Vs also compose, uh, but the composition is only uh, associative up to these coherent isomorphisms. So it looks like a bicategory vertically. And the alphas also compose uh, vertically, uh, and they're as associative as they can be, you know, once you stick in the isomorphisms for the associativities for the, the vertical arrows, okay. And then there's an interchange law. So, I mean, this, this is still a little bit vague. I'm going to be giving quite a few examples as I go along, but the whole point of the talk is <clears throat> that there's this relationship between the horizontal and the vertical, okay. Uh, at, 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 for the last part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about something that's going to sort of just trail off because I don't really know all of the answers, but the first part is uh, well, well established. So if how are two categories related? Well, the, actually the way Erisman defined the two category, he said it's a double category in which the vertical arrows are identities. Okay, he didn't, at the time actually uh, in rich category theory, uh, I don't know if it existed, but it certainly wasn't very well known. So he defined two categories as a double category in which the horizontal arrows are identities, but you still have these cells there. So you can see that this is like a two category, you have objects and you have arrows, and then you have cells, but the cells uh, are, are of this form, okay? Now, given any two category, uh, I, I denote the, the, any double category, any, I denote double categories with this blackboard bold here, which has like double lines in it. Uh, so uh, given any double category, I can extract out of it a two category, it's horizontal two category. So the horizontal two category of a double category is you take, you take the same objects and you take the horizontal arrows for the one cells in here. And for the two cells, you take uh, these special kind of cells here, uh, where the these the, the horizontal domain and codomain of alpha are identities. So this id a and id b are the vertical identities. Now these these compose horizontally. That's no problem. They they always did vertically. You see they don't quite compose because if you you compose two of these, you don't get id in the domain. You get id times id. Uh, and so you have to use then the, these isomorphisms, the lambda and the rho. You do this a little bit of work and you see that you get a two category out of it. So given a two category, uh, you get a, a double category, the, the horizontal double category uh, associated to the two category. And given a double category, you get uh, a, 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 a two category out of it, a horizontal A. 
Okay, actually, these are adjoint on one side or or the other. Uh, now, uh, there's a there's another maybe more symmetric way of turning a two category into a double category, and that's the two category of quintets. It's called that, that's also uh, Arisman's uh, notation. He called them quintets. So you start with a two category script A here, and you get a double category where the, the objects are the objects of A, the horizontal arrows are the one cells of A, the vertical arrows are also the one cells of A, and then the double cells here are the two cells between these two composites here from KF to GH. I could put the alpha in the other direction. This is the direction that I use. It's also the direction that uh, Erisman used. Actually, Erisman and Madame Erisman did an awful lot of work in the 60s and 70s on double categories, but it was pretty well ignored, partly because it was well ahead of its time, but also partly because of the uh, non-standard notation that he used, okay. So now given a bicategory, we can turn it into a two category, uh, into a double category, sorry, by putting the, the, the one cells vertically. Okay, so that given a bicategory B, we get a double category whose objects are the same as the objects of B. The horizontal arrows are just identities uh, and the vertical arrows are the one cells of B. And uh, the double cells are the two cells of B. Okay, so so this this given a bi category, we get a double category where the double cells look like this. And conversely, given a double category, we get a bi category out of it, the vertical part of it. Uh, and so uh, in in there, then uh, the objects are the same. Uh, but now the one cells of this uh, vert B here are the vertical arrows and the two cells are the double cells like this. These are called globular cells. Okay, so, so th this, this sort of gives you the, uh, the idea between how, how two categories, bi categories and double categories are related. Now, here, here, here is a, a nice example of a double category. It's a category of relations, relations in, let's, let's take uh, just relations in sets so that uh, rel would have as objects, just sets A, B, C, D, the horizontal arrows would be functions and the vertical arrows would be relations. And a cell, there's, there's at most one cell in every square and there's one exactly when, if you take a little a in a and a little b in b, if a is related to b by r, then f of a is going to be related, should be related to g of b by s. That's a condition to have a, a, um, a, a cell there. Otherwise there's no cell. So there's one or zero cells. Now this, this can be carried out for any regular category. So a regular category, is a category with finite limits uh, and uh, co-equalizers of kernel pairs. And the regular epis, which are the co-equalizer maps are stable under pullback. Okay, and so now a, a relation in, in this setting here is a sub-object of A cross B. So that's a relation from A to B. And then there's a cell here, uh, precisely when F cross G restricts to, 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 to the relations, okay, good. So every you, you, I mean, set, set theorists, you know, will define a function to be a relation uh, with certain properties. Whereas category theorists would think, okay, well, fun functions are more primitive and then relations are basically uh, uh, morphisms. Okay, something, something like, like this, okay. Uh, but in some sense, it's, it's actually better just to keep them separate and see how they're related. So that's this whole thing with the synergy thing, okay. So every uh, morphism in A gives rise to two relations, its graph, which, which, which I've defined here, it's a sub-object of A cross B given by A, and that's called the companion of F. Uh, and I denote it by F lower star. 
and the reverse of its graph, which is called the conjoint. And I denote that by F upper star. Now, companions and conjoints can be defined in any double category. They may or may not exist, but you can define this in any double category. And a good double categories will have companions and conjoints. So companion, V is a companion of F. So you have here a horizontal arrow in your double category, any double category, and a vertical arrow, but F goes from A to B. The vertical arrow also goes from A to B, but vertically. And you say that V is a companion of F. If you have cells like this, uh, binding cells, I call them, Ronnie Brown called them connections, psi and chi, such that if you compose them horizontally, you get a vertical identity. And if you compose them vertically, you get a horizontal identity. Now, companions, as I said, may or may not exist, but when they do exist, they're unique. They're unique up to isomorphism anyway. It's not, not completely unique. I mean, uh, yes, they're unique up to isomorphism. So I choose one and I call it F lower star. And so it's nice that the, the companion of the identity, the horizontal identity is a vertical identity. I mean, that, that should be uh, a good thing. And also that companions compose. So what we're thinking here is that V is, is, is the same as F or isomorphic to F, if you like, uh, but they're going in different directions. So you, you think, for example, of the graph of a function as composed to the function, okay. Now, uh, there are lots of dualities in, in uh, double categories, horizontal duality, vertical duality, you can transpose things. And I mean, depending on what you mean by a duality, you can have all the symmetries of the square. So there are eight of them, but one of them is identity and some of them have order four, but there are three basic dualities, horizontal, vertical, and then transpose. So if you take the vertical uh, dual uh, of this notion of companion, you get the notion of conjoint. So now you start with a horizontal F going from A to B, but a vertical arrow going from B to A. And you say that W is a conjoint uh, of F. If you have here uh, cells like this that I call conjunctions, such that if you compose uh, them horizontally, you get vertical identity and you compose them vertically, you get a horizontal identity, the same sort of thing, except that now here the alpha and beta are switched around. Okay. so. This is just a dual, one of the dual notion. Well, it's the only dual, all the others are, are the same a notion of uh, the conjoint is dual to a companion. And you, you, you want to think of this as saying that W is adjoint to F on some side or other, uh, even though there are different kinds of things. Okay, so there are different kinds of arrows then you, you, can, you can sort of say that they're, they're adjoint. So just by duality now, they're unique up to isomorphism. And when they exist, then uh, I write F upper star for one. Uh, again, the identity uh, has a conjoint, which is the vertical identity and they compose, but now there's this thing that's switched around. Now I mentioned adjoints. You can also define adjoints uh, in, in the double category. Uh, well, you have you have this uh, vertical by category, and we know how to define adjoints there. But just to see how how it looks in double category terms, okay, uh, we say that W is left adjoint to V if we have cells like this. So we have this epsilon uh, that goes from W V into the identity, if you like. But so this is what it looks like, and you have an eta that looks like this. And the triangle identities for adjoint then look like this. Okay, so this is one of them here. You, you compose eta with epsilon and you pad this with identities and you get uh, an identity. And uh, you also compose eta with epsilon in the different way. And again, you get an identity. Okay, so these, these are the well-known triangle equalities, although it doesn't look like a triangle here at all. Now, adjoints, companions, and conjoints uh, are intimately related. So uh, any, any two of these conditions here implies a third. Okay, so in particular, F lower star <coughs> is adjoint to F upper star. So this, this is uh, at odds with the 
the topos notation. But anyways, this is uh, uh, so, some people write f a shriek here. Uh, so f floor star is left adjoint to f upper star. If if w has a companion and a right adjoint, then the right adjoint is the conjoint, and so on. Okay, and in rel every every morphism rel of a every morphism has a companion namely its graph as i said before and a conjoint so what i gave you just say sort of explicitly now fits these definitions that i've given and in fact uh, every adjoint pair of relations is of that form okay so that's the reverse uh, so what calculus classes people call uh, the uh, the inverse relation of a function is in fact not an inverse relation. It's it's a right adjoint. Okay, it's not an inverse. I mean, it's a relation, but it's not an inverse. It's an adjoint. Okay, so uh, so this this is a story with companions and conjoints. So let's look at what happens with uh, quintets. So of course, quintets. Every horizontal arrow has a companion. I mean, the arrows are the same, right? The horizontal and the vertical arrows in quintets. Uh, are the same, but it fits the definition of companion. Whereas a horizontal arrow only has a conjoint if it has a left adjoint. In fact, uh, the, the double category of quintets is a free double category with companions generated by A. Okay, so that, that's, uh, that's sort of clear. I mean, you, you have to calculate things, but it looks sort of obvious. I mean, if, if you have a, a two category, it only has horizontal arrows and only vertical arrows, and you want you would like them to have companions, well, you sort of throw them in. So now you have your horizontal arrows and vertical arrows look the same, and then you just work it out, and it gives you, uh, uh, it, it gives you this result. But it's sort of surprising then, it's also co-free, co-generated by A transpose. So you switch the arrows around and somehow this is doesn't follow from duality, it's something different, okay. So uh, uh, here, here is the, the precise theorem of this. If you take uh, two category A here, you take its quintets, and then you take the horizontal two category of it, well, you get A back again. And what I'm saying is that the identity here is the unit for a by adjunction. So these these are adjunctions, but up to, up to uh, up to equivalence rather than uh, isomorphism, and uh, th th that's what you get. So this it's Hor here is is um, it's a two functor actually uh, from uh, double categories with companions into uh, into two cat, and then Q goes from two cat into double categories with companions. And now there, there's some sort of nasty uh, duality going on here, which I, I don't want to get into, but uh, Q is also right adjoint, but now to vert. Okay, so it's left adjoint to whore and right adjoint to vert, which I think I think is uh, is quite nice, but you have to you have to sort of uh, uh, put in some duality there. <laughs> now, uh, an, another uh, another way now of relating the horizontal to the vertical is with the notion of tabulator. So tabulators were inspired by Fried's um, tabulations. So this is in his in, in his book with Shedroff uh, and. They talk about tabulations, but uh, so the idea is, is that if you have a relation, you can make a table of all of its values. And they characterize uh, this equationally. But in fact, it's uh, it's better viewed, and I think in the context of double categories where it's a, it's a solution to a universal property. In fact, it's a, it's a horizontal limit. So, uh, a tabulator of a vertical arrow. So, I mean, what, what I'm sort of trying to do is to express vertical arrows in terms of horizontal ones. You know, so, I mean, with, with the other conjoints and, uh, and companions, I'm expressing horizontal arrows in terms of vertical. Now I'm taking a vertical arrow and I'd like to sort of say that it's, it's, it's sort of the, 
the adjoint to F composed with G. Okay, that's what I'm sort of thinking here. So it's a universal cell of this form. So a cell, a triangular cell like this, I just mean an ordinary double cell with an identity on the left. And saying that it's universal says that, so this, this, this is the tabulator here, says that for any C, there exists a unique horizontal arrow from X into T of V, uh, such that when you compose X with this tau, you get C again. Okay, so this, this is the notion of tabulator. And the tabulator is effective if uh, the, this, uh, this T1 here has a companion. So there's a vertical arrow going in the same direction and T0 has a conjoint. So there's a vertical arrow going in the other direction. And so if you compose this conjoint with companion, you get something isomorphic to V. So effective uh, tabulators, that was sort of Fry's idea, just in, in, in the case of, uh, of categories of relations uh, uh, are, are the good ones, okay? And uh, rel A has effective tabulators, okay? So, I mean, that's almost uh, a tautology in a sense. I mean, a, a relation from A to B is a subobject of A cross B. So it's, it's, it's a set. Uh, R together with two projections, and you just have to work out to see that the universal property here uh, is uh, it's the right one. Okay, so uh, this is the notion of tabulator and effective tabulator, and rel A has effective tabulators. This 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 was used uh, by Barr a long time ago in his uh, paper on relational algebras. Uh, where he had a monad on a category and he wants to extend it uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the, the two cate category of relations. And so he knows what it does to arrows, but he wants to say, what, what would it do to, to a relation? So he writes the relation uh, as, as sort of the, the adjoint of a function followed by the function. And then he applies uh, the monad to that. Okay, so th this has a long history in the case of relations, but it's much more general. So if we look uh, at quintets, so the tabulators in, in quintets will exist provided that you have comma objects. Okay, and they're effective as well. So the tabulator is given actually by the comma object uh, of F with the identity on B. So that's, it's not really hard to see in any double category, but you can also just calculate it in cat. It's the same thing. Uh, and you, you, get, you get this uh, tabulator here. So uh, as a corollary, then a two category has comma objects. If, if, it, if it has comma objects, uh, which all, all good two categories do, uh, then the horizontal part the horizontal double category of it has tabulators. So it, in, in, in this double category here, you only have identity uh, uh, vertical arrows, but it's, it's a non-trivial sort of thing, okay? So it's saying that you have an object which uh, Gray calls phi of A, such that two cells between arrows from X to A correspond to just uh, one cells from X into phi of A. He calls this a representable two category. It's, it's where uh, the two cells actually can be defined in terms of one cells. So if you're thinking in cat, for example, phi of A would be the category, the arrow category, A to the two. So a functor from a category X into the arrow category, the same thing as two functors and a natural transformation. Okay, so, so this, this is a special case of tabulators in the case of this kind of uh, double category. Now, here is uh, a somewhat different example. Uh, I'm going to look at the double category of monoidal categories. So monoidal category is a category with a tensor product. I'm not assuming that it's closed. I'm not assuming that it's metric or anything, just double category, like, like AB, for example, has a tensor product or any Cartesian category, they, you know, or, or sets with, with co-product even is, is, is a monoidal category, okay? And so in, in this double category, the objects are just 
monoidal categories. You can take small monoidal categories if you like. And the horizontal arrows are monoidal functors. So not strong, but just monoidal. So the, there's a comparison between F of the tensor and uh, no, no, the tensor of the Fs and F of the tensor. Okay, so going from F of, uh, V1 tensor F V2 into F of V1 tensor V2. So instead of saying that they're uh, that they're equal as you would like for a homomorphism of monoids or that they're isomorphic uh, as you would say, uh, maybe just sort of relaxing it a little bit, you're saying that there's merely a comparison. There's also a comparison for identities and these satisfy some conditions, okay, which uh, if you try to write them down, uh, you'll get them right, okay. Uh, now the vertical arrows uh, are the co-monoidal functors. And so those uh, have a comparison between H of, uh, of the tensor and the tensor of the Hs. So of course you can't compose, well, you can compose a monoidal with a co-monoidal, you just get a functor. It, does, it doesn't respect the tensor in any way whatsoever, okay. So, so these, these, these come, come up uh, all the time, okay. These two kinds of morphisms. So for example, the forgetful functor from abelian groups into sets, sets with Cartesian product and abelian groups with the usual tensor product. Well, the tensor product of two abelian groups is not, is not just their Cartesian product, okay? But there is this comparison here from the, the, the Cartesian product of the, the underlying sets of the abelian groups in, into the underlying set of the tensor product, okay? And the co-monoidal functors also come up all the time. Now, do you, have, do you have an example of a co-monoidal functor? Because usually it's it's either monoidal functor or or isomorphic. Well, yeah, it's a uh, uh, right. They, they probably I, show up. right. I can't I can't think of one just off the top of my head, but uh, uh, they abound. <laughs> <laughs> well, anytime there's an isomorphism, a, a strong monoidal functor is automatically a, a co-monoidal functor. So, yes, a strong monoidal functor is. Is monoidal and it's co-monoidal. Right. Okay. Uh, but uh, no, I uh, well, yeah. I mean, given five minutes, you know, uh, in the morning, I, I could come up with uh, several examples of them. But right now, uh, 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 are you assuming your monoidal uh, categories are strict, or they uh, said no, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is, is that even though uh, when you compose uh, a monoidal functor with a co-monoidal functor, uh, you don't get anything that that relates it to the tensor. You can still define the correct notion of a transformation. Transformation going in this direction here. Okay, so co-monoidal composed with monoidal into monoidal composed with co-monoidal. Okay, and so it's a natural transformation from Kf to Gh such that this this hexagon here commutes. Now in this hexagon, you see, you, you have T of uh, V1 tensor V2 and T of V1 and T of tensor T of V2. And you'd like to say somehow that they're related. And so here you see, uh, you, um, you have the, the, um, the monoidal structure for F goes from FV1 tensor FV2 into F of V1, V2, and you apply K to it. Whereas going down here, you're using the co-monoidal structure of K. And, and the, the same thing on the other side. Now, uh, there's also a pentagon condition for I as well, okay? So you just write that down. You're trying to say that T of I is the same as I, but then you have to add in these things. And it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to note that T has to go in this direction. It has, it has to go from comonoidal composed with monoidal into monoidal composed with comonoidal. If you try to reverse it, uh, then you get here a pentagon in which no two arrows compose at all. Okay, there's no condition that you can impose. So, so I think that's interesting. Now, uh, perhaps, uh, early in life, you were sort of uh, marked by the fact that uh, uh, 
uh, hexagons, com commutative hexagons might be really bad. Okay, so you're thinking of uh, dinatural transformations, or at least if you had my education, uh, dinatural transformations came up, and it's a shock that dinatural transformations don't compose at all. But in fact, these, these guys do compose, okay? They compose in both ways, horizontally and vertically. Uh, there's no problem. And somehow hexagons can mean one of two things. It can mean bad news, uh, or it can mean that really it's a commutative cube. And so you can write out a cube here. I'm not, I, I, I didn't make any slide for it in which these are all the faces of the cube and then it's a commutative cube. And then it's sort of completely obvious that they compose, but you just try to compose them like you would compose uh, 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 quintets and, and it works. Okay, so, so you're not sort of trying to stick two, uh, two hexagons together. You have one hexagon and the other one goes on top of it like this sort of to the right and on top. And there's little parallelograms here. I mean, it all works out. Okay, so this this is this is a nice uh, double category which combines the, the monoidal and the co-monoidal functors. Uh, now, let's look at some of the properties of it. So, f has a companion if and only if these two monoidal structures here, phi and phi zero, are isos. So that's a strong monoidal functor. Is what uh, Nozan was just talking about. So uh, strong monoidal functors are companion pairs. So they're, you can consider them as, uh, as monoidal uh, and comonoidal at the same time, but in, in, at the same time, but in, in the right way, okay? So that uh, the monoidal and the comonoidal structure are inverse to each other. And F will have a conjoint if and only if it has a left adjoint. So if you have a monoidal functor, which has a left adjoint, the left adjoint is automatically uh, co-monoidal. And uh, so, that, that, so that, that's, that's what this is saying here. It's saying that F has a conjoint. If and only if F uh, has a left adjoint, then the left adjoint will be its conjoint. So you see, uh, when I was saying that you should think of uh, uh, conjoints as being sort of adjoint in some sense. Uh, well, in this case here, it's exactly that. So you have two sort of different kinds of morphisms, but they're adjoint to each other. Okay, so that's that's this conjoint thing. And maybe uh, surprisingly, uh, monoidal categories it has effective tabulators. So it's sort of I think it's surprising that that it has tabulators. So if you take a vertical arrow, that's a comonoidal functor from V to X, its tabulator is again, is um, the, um, it's a comma object, the comma, comma category, H uh, uh, comma X like this. So an object in there is a, is, is a V1 in V and an X1 in X and a morphism in X as well, going from H of V1 into X. So that this, this thing here is a typical object in this comma category. And you tensor them by tensoring the Vs, and tensoring the Xs, and you tensor these two arrows, but when you tensor the arrows, they don't go exactly where you want them to go. They go from HV1 tensor HV2 into X1 tensor X2, like here. And so then you use here the comonoidal structure. So this, you see, this wouldn't work like this for, for monoidal categories. Of course, there's some duality going on and you can get something. You have to put the H on the other side, but uh, so th this, this, is, this is the, uh, the tensor product. And it, it's, it's a fun exercise to show that it satisfies all the coherence properties, namely uh, the Pentagon and the identity laws uh, for monoidal category. And it uses here the properties of this uh, co-monoidal structure here, okay. Identities are also, this is, you take identity here, identity there, and you look at the comparison from between the identities. Now, you, you'll notice that this has projections down to V and X, namely you project onto V1 here or X1. And from the definition that I just gave you of this, 
it preserves H preserves the tensor. I mean, not even only up to isomorphism, but preserves it on the nose. Okay, uh, so it it uh, it is a strong monoidal functor, strict one in fact, but it's in particular strong, and so uh, it it is it has a companion. Okay, namely uh, uh, H, but now uh, it is a companion. I mean, okay, well, um, no. Uh, just confusing. The projections, the projections have companions. Okay, so that's the rejection projecting onto V is V1 or projecting onto X. They both have companions, but in fact, the projection onto V here, which takes uh, this onto V1 has a left adjoint. The left adjoint takes a V in V and it gives you a V and something from H of V into some X and this, the X that you take is H of V and identity. So the, this is the left adjoint so that this P1 has a conjoint. And it's sort of clear that if you, if you, you, uh, you, st you start with a V and you apply the conjoint, so you get this. And then after that, you apply the companion of the projection two, you get H of V, you get H back again. Okay, so uh, this, this, this double category has a tabulator. Now, uh, another uh, source of uh, double categories is the Claisley construction. Okay, so if you take a, just a monad on a category, uh, then uh, you can build a double category with the same objects as A. The horizontal arrows are the morphisms of A. The vertical arrows now are Claisley morphisms. So uh, Claisley morphism, from A to C is a morphism in A from A to T of C. And uh, there's going to be a cell here at most one, and there is one precisely when this uh, square here commutes. Uh, now, the vertical composition is Claisley composition. Okay, so uh, I, I don't want to go into that. If you don't know it, it won't help me just to, to give you a, a two minute tutorial, but. Uh, standard thing okay so you you compose you apply t then you apply the uh, the multiplication of the monad okay so this gives you a nice double category called the Claisley double category of t and in 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 there every horizontal whoops what did i do uh, uh every horizontal arrow uh has a companion so this is just a standard way of embedding a into the Claisley category, uh, you, you take F and you compose it with the unit uh, for the monad, okay? So, uh, but that that is a companion uh, for F, uh, but there are hardly any conjoints. Uh, a horizontal arrow is a conjoint if and only if T of F is iso, okay? So uh, you could write down uh, easily enough what, what the, the conjoint is. Uh, but again, surprisingly, it has uh, tabulators under mild conditions. The tabulator of V is the pullback of, of V along uh, the unit here, okay? And so uh, if you have pullbacks along uh, A to C, then you get tabulators. Now, these tabulators are not effective, but tabulators that aren't effective are good nonetheless. So there's a whole theory of um, horizontal limits uh, in double categories. And uh, uh, there's a construction theorem. You can construct any horizontal limit. Okay, so these, these are pretty complicated things using products, equalizers, and tabulators. So this, this sort of bumps up the usual thing that we know that we can construct uh, uh, we can construct limits using products and equalizers. Now, if you add in tabulators, you get all the double limits, okay? So, so tabulators are good even if they're not effective. Now, we can bump this up and take uh, a two monad, okay? And so uh, given a two monad, you start off with a two category and a two monad then is a two functor T, uh, which, uh, and, and such that the, the multiplication and the unit 
are, are two natural, two natural transformations, okay? And you get the same sort of thing. The horizontal arrows are uh, uh, just the arrows in A, the, the one cells in A. Uh, the vertical arrows are the Kleisley uh, one cells like this. So it's a one cell, but into T of C. And a cell here is a two cell in A now, but going in, in this square here. Okay, so it's a, it's a quintet, but of this special, special film. And then the previous theorem here also applies. Every horizontal arrow has a companion. It's the same as before. Now F has a conjoint if and only if TF, before it was that it was an ISO, now if it has a left adjoint. So if TF has a left adjoint, then F has a companion. And V has a tabulator provided that the comic object of V with A to C exists. Okay, so that simply just bumping up, maybe putting it in a more natural uh, 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 setting. Okay. Now, the rest, the rest of, of the talk is going to be about the following uh, question about when can you represent a vertical arrow as a horizontal arrow into something else? Okay. Uh, now, this, this, I think, is a really important uh, concept. And the idea is pretty simple. You have here just a natural bijection between vertical arrows from X into A and horizontal arrows from X into some object P of A. Now, uh, it's a little bit tricky to actually define precisely. And this is where I, I'm, I'm going to to go, uh, first of all, an easy case, then a more complicated case, and then finally the last case, which uh, I don't exactly know what to do with, uh, but uh, I, I will explain what it's about. Okay, so um, the uh, the Kleisley, uh double category, of course, has representable vertical arrows because a vertical arrow from X to A is defined to be uh, a morphism uh, in, in, in A from X into T of A. So here the Kleisley category does have representable vertical arrows and the P is uh, T. Now, if you look at the category, the, the double category of relations in A, now A, A has to be a, a regular category here, then uh, this will, will will have representable vertical arrows if and only if A is a topos. And then the P of A here is the power object of A. Okay, so that we know a relation in the topos, a relation from X to A is the same thing as a morphism from X into the power object. Like, so for in sets, for example, uh, a relation from X to A is the same thing as a function from X into two to the A to the power set of A, right? Uh, so Kleisley has them, rel A, if and only if A is a topos, and then there's another double category, which I didn't define, the category where the, uh, the objects are the same as A, well, it's, it's a sub-double category of rel determined by, well, no, let, let me go back. You only need A here to have pullbacks, okay? So here you need to be regular category. So A, any category with pullbacks, you can construct a double category where the vertical arrows now are partial morphisms. And again, uh, this, this will have representable vertical arrows if and only if uh, A is a topos. So let's try and make this a bit more precise. Uh, what did I mean by naturality? Okay, so there's something uh, hidden in here. So naturality will use companions. So what it's saying then, saying that if you have a, a vertical arrow V, which corresponds to V hat from X into P of A, and you compose this V hat with X, that's going to be the classifying morphism for the composite of V with the companion of X. Okay, so here it is, it's V composed with the companion of X, hat, okay, so that's classifying morphism, is the classifying morphism of uh, uh, V composed with X. 
Now, uh, okay, we'd like to define this as uh, uh, the, the condition that th this functor here going from horizontal A into vertical A, taking companions, uh, that this have a right adjoint. Okay, so for this, uh, we need, first of all, that A is a strict double category because you see, I mean, here I have a category. This is a category, this is a category. So if if, uh, if A were non-strict, this would be a bi-category, but if you forget the two cells, then you don't have any associativity at all. Okay, so let's assume now that A, uh, first of all, is strict. That means that the alpha, lambda, and rho are identities. And uh, we say that A has a functorial choice of companions. So companions compose and uh, the companion of the identity is the identity, but only up to isomorphism. So suppose we have a way of choosing companions so that they compose on the nose and identities uh, are companions on the nose, okay? And all, all of our examples so far are like that. So uh, A has a functorial choice of companions if, if there's a functor, uh, which uh, going from horizontal A to vertical A, and it, it takes any horizontal arrow F to a vertical arrow between the same objects. Uh, and we also give binding cells and these binding cells have to uh, be compatible with composition. Okay, so that the binding cell of FG is, is here. Okay, so this, uh, if, you, if you write it out, this is uh, uh, the reasonable condition. Okay, so this, uh, uh, this is what it means to have a functorial choice of companions. So now let's assume that, first of all, A is strict. It has a canonical right, choice of companions and this choice is functorial. So we say that vertical arrows are strictly representable if this, this uh, companion functor here has a right adjoint P. And so that, that means that for every A and A, there's an object P of A, and a vertical arrow like this, such that for every other vertical arrow into A, there exists a unique horizontal arrow such that you recover V by composing with this uh, E of A and taking, uh, taking companions, okay? And so our, our examples, uh, quintets uh, satisfy this. Here, here, the P of A is the identity. Kleisley for a two monad, satisfy this. Rel E, where E is a topos, and par E, uh, also when E is a topos. Now, uh, there's a problem with this. And the problem is, is that it depends on the choice, uh, on the choice of uh, the functorial choice of companions. Okay, so sure, different choices will be isomorphic, but <laughs> The isomorphism is not in the right place. So let's let's just look at an example. So we take a category and we build here the chaotic double category of squares. So it's it's all squares, and in, inside of each square, commutative or not, there's a unique cell. So you see, then all 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 the arrows are isomorphic. Everything is is. is is isomorphic there. So you take the horizontal part, you get A. Take the vertical part, you get A. And any functor from A to A, which is the identity on objects, is going to give you a functorial choice of companion, okay? Because it's a functor, so it's functorial. And uh, any H is, is a companion. A, H goes from A to B and F goes from A to B. They're companions because the binding cells, I mean, there's always one, okay? So, so a functorial choice, any functor, identity on objects uh, will give you uh, uh, a, a functorial choice of companions. Now, you might not just off, off the top of your head be able to think of various categories which are the identity on objects between categories, but here, here is an example. You take A to be the category of sets with pairs of functions as morphisms rather than just mere functions. So th this, 
uh, you may think is contrived and well maybe it is a bit but in fact it's it's a Kleisley category for the squaring monad okay so uh, a morphism is a function from a morphism in here from a to b is a function from a and to b to the two okay so but just consider it here as a category of sets with pairs of functions so you have the identity you always have the identity from a to a which is of course the identity on objects but you can also take the functor uh which switches the f and the g the two the two arrows so this this functor here is not isomorphic to the identity okay so it's never if a is not trivial it's never isomorphic to the identity it's its own inverse it's its own adjoint i mean it's it's its own inverse okay uh, and so it's inverse to itself and the inverse is the adjoint okay so it's this is its own adjoint so now here we have two different functors one from the identity from a to a and f and the, the their adjoints are not isomorphic but even worse if you look at this functor here, which takes fg and it sends it to ff, this does this. This also gives you a functorial choice of companion, uh, but uh, but it doesn't have an adjoint at all. Okay, so so th this this is not a, a, a good state of affairs. Although in the examples we had, we had nice canonical choices rather than rather than just arbitrary choices. Okay, so. So the other definition is, is, is good in certain circumstances, but it needs upgrading, okay? So maybe while I was talking about this, you said you were thinking, oh, instead of taking right back here, there, instead of taking vert A, I should take the bi-category uh, vert A, and here maybe the two category, maybe leave it as a category, whatever, okay? And so, uh, <coughs> uh, in fact, if we have companions, then any choice, functorial or not, uh, will give you here a pseudo functor. So that's that's what I'm saying that the, the companions are are unique up to isomorphism. It's giving you here a pseudo functor. Okay, it's not it's not actually a functor from this into the bold phase, but into the bi category vertical of A. Okay. In fact. All double categories with companions arise this way. So you, you start with a category and a bicategory and a pseudo functor from A into B. And then you get this category, which sort of generalizes the quintets. The objects and arrows uh, are just from A, uh, and, but a vertical arrow from A to A prime is a morphism in B from phi of A to phi of A prime. Okay, so uh, and and the cell is a two cell in B. So here, this is this is a typical double cell here. In 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 this category Q of phi, and it, what, it, here's what it looks like, and every F uh, has a companion here. Uh, uh, the companion of F is phi of F. Okay, so phi, if you if you stick here uh, for V phi of F and F. Then you're going to get phi f f and so 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 this works. This gives you uh, a bijection between uh, double categories with a choice of companions, not necessarily functorial, but everything has has a companion, and you choose one. You get bijection between that and um, and uh, this this sort of setup here. Okay, a pseudo functor from a category in and to be which is the identity on objects you don't need it to be the identity on objects to define this but just to get the correspondence uh, it, it, you, you need it to be the identity on objects okay so uh, so th this this situation here is something that comes up all the time uh, but uh, by adjoints so you, you you might think okay well we have this five star maybe we bump up the horizontal part also to the two category and the, the phi star actually gives you a pseudo functor from the horizontal. There, there's a duality here. You have to switch the order of the, uh, the, the, the vertical order of two cells, okay, uh, uh, from there into vert. So you might think then that the P that I'm looking for is simply a bi adjoint to this, okay, but it doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work just in the double category of relations. And you see why, okay, so you, well, you have two sets, 
and relation R uh, and relation S both from A to B. And suppose then that uh, R, uh, R is contained in S, okay. Then you look at the function that you get from A into the power set of B. And uh, these functions now, there, there are no two cells here, okay. So there's nothing to send this to, okay. And in fact, Kleisley doesn't work either, okay. So actually index categories will show the way. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm right that I can go over time a little bit, right? Over over an hour, is that right, Nose on. Perfect, perfect. I'm enjoying this, it's very interesting. Thank you, go on okay. as long as you want. Okay, well, <laughs> as long as, yes, I, I'm going to finish soon, okay. But so uh, an index category is just a pseudo functor from the opposite of some category uh, into cat. And in, in the theory of index categories, we can define uh, what it means for an index category to be essentially small, namely that it's represented by a category object in S. So you need finite uh, limits in S, okay. Uh, it's represented in this way. So you hum into, uh, so this is S is just a category with, with finite limits. But if you take it, you put a category object here and you hum into it, you get a category popping out. Okay, and so it's essentially small if phi is equivalent to this. So let's let's look at what this means sort of in, uh, in elementary terms. It says that there's sort of these two parametrizing objects. This is an object, the object, uh, and, and another one, and the d0 and a d1. And in phi, so phi of c0 is a category. So there's a generic object in there. And uh, then when we, we apply this, this phi, we pull the g back in, into phi of c1, then there's a generic morphism. So there's a generic object and a generic morphism. And the universal property says that uh, for every a in, in, in some phi of a, there exists an alpha from i into c0 and an isomorphism from uh, between a and phi of a. So that every a is isomorphic to phi of g, uh, phi uh, of, of something applied to g. I'm not saying that this alpha is unique here. It's, it's not necessarily. And then for any two uh, alpha and beta into C0 and a morphism. Now, so th this now is going on in phi of uh, C1, a morphism from phi alpha G into phi beta G. Then there exists a unique. Now this guy is unique, this gamma, making these two triangles commute and this commute here. Okay. so. So th this is just, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if, if you haven't seen this before, it might be a little bit complicated uh, and it is, okay. So let's apply this then to the following thing. We, we, we take our setup here. So now I'm just taking, uh, oh, one thing that I should mention is that this here doesn't use the fact that we have a category object. If we have pullbacks, this, this here will, will extend uh, extend to be a category object, but we don't need it. Okay, we just need two objects, two arrows, an object here, an arrow there, and universal property. Okay, so we apply that. We take the, our horizontal thing here. We go into vert by taking companions, and then we hum into A. So we're fixing an A for the moment into cat. And uh, th this here is going to be essentially small, it means that vertical arrows into A are representable. So this is weakly representable, if you like. If there exists two objects, P of A, that's the same P that I used to have, and Q of A, two arrows, a vertical arrow, okay, and a cell. So this vertical arrow corresponds to the generic object before. So it's the generic vertical morphism into A, if you like. And this here is the generic arrow that I mentioned before. And the universal property then says that uh, for every V, we have this V hat as before, but now V is only isomorphic to EA composed with V hat star. Okay, before I had it equal and that was not really a good thing to do. And then there's another condition here on, on cells, which I will, I will skip, 
but let's just go on to the examples now. If we have a topos and we look at the double category of relations, then P of A is still the power object, okay, as before, but the Q of A is the order on P of A. So now we've got the order stuck in there, okay? <laughs> Par of A, again, for Eotopos, then P of A was the partial morphism classifier. It's what it used to be called alpha tilde. Uh, and Q of A is also the order on it. And if we look at the Kleisley, uh, the Kleisley uh, double category of a two monad, uh, then the P of A is a T of A, as, as I mentioned, and Q of A, this, this is the two cell classifier in, in gray, in gray's representability. So if, if A is gray representable, then this is what the Q of A is. So for example, if A is just a category, okay, it's this locally discrete, then the phi is it's just the identity. So we, Q of A would be T of A. But like in cat, this is a TA to the two, okay. So, so this is that, and uh, so I, I just like to look at a slightly different example here because, uh, uh, well, yeah, okay. Look at monoidal categories, but where I'm going to restrict the horizontal arrows to be strong. And this, the vertical arrows now are co-representable here. So now we fix the V and for each V there's a P of V such that, uh, a co-monoidal functor here corresponds to now a, a strong uh, functor there. So the objects of P of V are finite sequences of objects of V and the morphisms uh, are, are pairs where the first guy is, uh, is an order preserving map going from the index or the, the codomain here M into the index here N, okay. And the, the FIs here uh, go from VI into the tensor product of or the Im inverse image of I, of the, of the Vs, okay? And you, you keep them in the, in, in the same order. And the tensor product is concatenation. I think this is quite interesting and I haven't completely figured out what the Q of V is. Uh, I don't know, up, up, up until uh, this morning, I thought that it was just the same P here, but applied to two cross V with two given the Cartesian monoidal structure. But I think maybe that's wrong. I, I don't know what it is, but I think, I mean, uh, I'll be able to figure this out within a day or two. And I think it's something quite obvious. Now, uh, all of the examples I gave were strict double categories. And I started off by saying that it combines uh, two categories and by categories, but I didn't have, I mean, the examples, you know, where I had representable uh, uh, vertical arrows were all strict. And so uh, in the non-strict case, there, um, I, I think it's more important, but it's, I don't exactly know what's going on, but there's something going on. So here is a double category where the objects are rings and the horizontal arrows are homomorphisms, the vertical arrows uh, are, are bimodules. And so a bimodule, so this, this is a, an SR bimodule considered as a morphism from R to S is the same thing as an additive functor from R into S mod, okay? And left S modules. So R considered as an additive category. So, so there is a representing thing, but it's not, it's not an object in ring somehow. And it's, it's large and it's, but it's definitely telling us something. It is not a, it's not a useless fact. It's it's a, this is telling us something about what uh, what bimodules are, and the same thing goes uh, in, in in cat. This is the double category of categories, functors, and profunctors. Now a, a vertical arrow is a profunctor from A to B, and that's the same thing as a functor into the this functor category sets to the B opposite. So uh, depending on what you think a profunctor is, you might want to say it sets to the B opposite rather than sets to the B all opposite, but this is my convention here. So span A, when A is a topos, for example, I have no idea what to put for these things. And so I, I, there's a lot much, uh, lot much more work to be done. Uh, and uh, there, I, I will stop there. Thank you.
Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, one second, let me put on. Okay, anyways, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Are there any questions? I, I just, I, I love the first part the most because it finally, I mean, you know, there's bi categories, you know, there's two categories, and you know, there's double categories, but I didn't think there was such beautiful relationships between them. So okay, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Any questions, any comments, any criticisms, any discussion? The criticism, yes. <laughs> Anyways, hearing no questions, um, I just wanted to invite everyone. Next week is our uh, season finale, and you're all welcome to join us. Um, um, but other than that, thank you very much. I. I uh, uh, there was a few comments in the in the chat. You probably didn't have a chance to see them. No, I didn't see them. No. Right. Um, yeah, your slides are really nice. Anyways, okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Uh, see you all next week. Take care. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Take care.